Wow, good afternoon, everyone. Is this on? You guys hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. You can do a little bit better than that. You're, you're, our, our offices are right here across from this building, so give me a nice big good afternoon again. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. That's better. That's better. So I'm going to talk about uh, three things, basically. Let's see if I can get my technology to work here. And what we're going to do is talk a little bit about... so the accounting and business environment, I decided I'm gonna kind of give you guys the same thing I would tell most of our members or what we talk about around the country with folks. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some career advice and a little bit about my own story and kind of how I got here. I also wanna uh, recognize and introduce two folks from our team who are right back here. That's Jackie Brown, our Chief Operating Officer. Say hi to Jackie Brown. And Rebecca Brown, who is a CPA. Also, she is the Member Engagement Pipeline Manager, and she's responsible for a lot of our student uh, leadership academy, young professionals, as well as just general membership activity. So welcome, Rebecca, as well. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to, walk, I'm going to go down here and work from here if this uh, clicker works right. Looks like it does. I'd like to be a little bit closer to you guys. How many of you are accounting majors? Raise your hands. So quite a bit. How about IT, information systems or technology? Business, just general business? What else am I missing? What else? Finance, where's my finance majors? All right, any other ones I'm missing? Welcome. All right, so obviously I'm a CPA and I'm with the Maryland Association of CPAs. I'm going to talk a little bit about the CPA career side. And maybe I'll switch a few of you. Um, but I'm also going to kind of give you some of the general things. It took me 29 years to be a member of Beta Alpha Psi. So uh, I was inducted by the Salisbury chapter uh, in 2011, and uh, the Loyola chapter uh, gave me a, an outstanding alumnus award. So I am actually an honorary Beta Alpha Psi member. Uh, when I was going to college, I went to night school at Loyola, and so we didn't really have a Beta Alpha Psi at night at that time. So I don't know that I would have made it anyhow. I don't think I'm smart enough. So I am glad to be here, honored to be here, because you guys represent the future of our profession. Now, who wants to be a millionaire? How many of you guys would like to be a millionaire? All right, so apparently, the difference between a general accounting major and a CPA over a career is actually a million dollars. So you'll make a million dollars more if you actually go through that extra certification. And I'm sure in, in a lot of the other majors, that's true for other things. But literally, that's what the research would say, that differential. So I know it's a tough exam. It's a lot of work. But it does pay off. And obviously, it's a long-term investment from that standpoint. So um, think about that as you look at where you're going to go from your career standpoint. But now I want to kind of take you to the beach. Because uh, we titled this thing Big Waves of Change. I think we said mountains of opportunity. Actually, it should be oceans of opportunity, since they're both around the water. But if you go down to the beach, how many of you guys have been to the beach? Hoping most of you. right? Or you at least know what a beach looks like. Anyhow, uh, in Maryland, our beach is pretty much Ocean City, Maryland. And if you go down there, imagine you're out on this hot, sunny day. The sand is nice and hot. Sun's overhead. You kind of hear the seagulls out squawking around. And you go into that water, and in the mid-Atlantic, that water is a bit cold. So there's kind of two ways I think about going into the water here. One is, I call it the, the gradual inch by inch, where you kind of walk in and you freeze about an inch of your leg at a time. And the other way is you just get really hot on the beach and you just run and jump in and, and get that freezing all over at one time. But once you're in there, invariably, you're, you're in there, you might be swimming around a little bit and the waves are coming. And sometimes you'll focus your attention on the shore. Right? You might wave to some of your friends or be looking at what's going on on the beach. And what happens when one of those big waves begins to like sneak up on you? Right? There's always that like rogue wave. And sure enough, that wave kind of crumbles over you. You get thrown around. They call it the washing machine. You get all sandy, salty. And you get back up. And what happens when you usually stand back up if you're not careful? Another wave comes, right? Like another wave hits you. And you get tumbled again. And I think we're in an environment where the waves are actually getting bigger and they're getting more frequent. 
So we like to say, there's a great saying I love that says, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. And I would say what I'm going to talk to you guys about is learning how to surf from a career perspective. And it's actually the same advice right now that I'm giving to every CPA out there. Because there are some huge waves of change hitting our profession, hitting the business environment like never before. And I'm going to talk about some of those and talk about some ideas for how you might deal with that kind of environment, right? Learn how to surf. So when you're out there in those waves, you have to start two things. First of all, you have to turn your attention where? To the waves, right? If you're looking at the shore, you're not going to be able to see those coming over you. So you have to be focusing on that future oriented. Where is it coming? And then there's a couple ways of dealing with it, right? You could dive through a big wave if it starts to curl and you're going to get crushed. You can kind of dive through it quickly. You can do the like one arm and try to break it, right, with your side. Uh, or you can turn around and surf it in, right? You can ride the wave back in. So those are kind of three strategies for playing around with these big waves of change. But let me talk to you about what we're seeing in these big waves of change. This is from the most recent World Economic Forum at Davos, Switzerland. And uh, this is the chairman of the World Economic Forum. And he's got this quote that says, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. In its scale, scope, and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. So this is pretty exciting because this is the environment you guys are graduating into. And certainly from all of your experiences at Beta Alpha Psi, it puts you, I think, in a pretty unique way to kind of take advantage of it. Another way we talk about this is VUCA. Now VUCA sounds like a nice Italian word, but it actually stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous times. It was coined by the Army War College back around uh, 2000, right, right before and all the kind of chaos around the world started. But they've now applied it to the business environment. The Institute for the Future started to use it a few years back, right around 2007 when there was a great recession. And so from that point forward, they said it really wasn't a typical recession. It was actually a fundamental shift in the way business is now conducted. And we're starting to see that shift evolve more and more frequently as we go. And this is the number one reason that that's happening, right? Technology. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from today is to understand that this exponential curve, also called Moore's Law, right? Which Moore's Law says that technology processing power doubles every year. And that's been going on for 50 years. Uh, and they say that's likely to continue. You're seeing some people disputing whether it's going to keep going at that rate or not. But doubling every year is pretty intense. But it's also deceptive because the early parts of exponential change actually seem like linear change, like normal linear change. So let me give you the quick differential what that means. So if I do a linear move and I go 1, 2, up to 30, right? Just think, imagine I go 30. How, many, how much distance will I cover in roughly 30 linear steps? Anyone guess? 30 yards, right? Roughly 30 meters, something like that. Basically, one step so a yard. Now, if I go 30 steps exponentially, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, right? You know that deal. 30 times, what, how much distance will I cover? Anyone guess? How much? So my, I figure, I figure bait off a side, you guys would be on this. Exponential growth. What would it be? 30 steps exponentially? One billion. One billion yards. See the difference between 30 exponential and 30 linear? That's happening right now in our environment. Now we're 50 years in, which means we're like in the trillions. But what that means is one trillion becomes next year two trillion. The year after that, three trillion. I mean, excuse me, four trillion. So uh, this is what I want you to know because this is not only just processing power in technology, but it's also digital storage and bandwidth are also increasing exponentially. And that's what's creating what we call the Uberization of everything, right? That's why you're seeing uh, all the disruptions that technology is causing, whether it's Airbnb or Uber or some of those things. Last year I was in New York City 
And in March, they had headlines that said there are now more black Uber cars in New York City than yellow taxi cabs. Now, Uber does not own one physical asset. They don't own any cars. Yet, they have completely displaced the taxi cab industry out of nowhere. Airbnb, how many of you guys have ever used Airbnb? Okay, so Airbnb, it took them about six years to get a million properties that they have listed in their, in their uh, database. It took Marriott and Hilton a hundred years to get a million rooms under management. That's the difference between linear and exponential. And that's why we're seeing industries get upended overnight. And I would argue that even accounting has its sights from that standpoint. There was a headline last week that KPMG is now using IBM Watson to do audit work. Uh, and it's going to automate dramatically. And it's not just automating number crunching. IBM Watson is a cognitive computer. It understands English. So it actually can read audit standards and rules and apply them. We were working with a futurist who actually worked with IBM and said that IBM Watson read a million cookbooks and created a unique recipe. And how long do you think it took it for it to read and comprehend a million cookbooks relative to taste and sense and all those things? A million cookbooks and then understand it and spit back out a unique recipe. It's like three seconds. Three seconds. That's, and now next year, that will be like a fraction of that, right? Based on the way technology is moving. So that's what we're dealing with. You're kind of coming online when this type of technology that was only dreamed about in the past is now all the time. This is a study from uh, Fry and Os Osborne at um, Oxford University. And they said that our profession is the second most likely to be automated in the next 20 years. And that goes, tax repairs have a 98.7% chance of being automated, and, 90, and accountants and auditors, 93.5. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, what am I going to do with my career? What am I going to do for a job from that standpoint? The fact is what? It's automating all of the base level number crunching that's going on, and now you're getting to apply your brain, right? The true knowledge and judgment and all that background in terms of body of knowledge. This can be true in all your other professions, by the way, too, finance, et cetera. So I think it's kind of exciting for you guys because what they're actually saying, and in that article that, about KPMG and Watson, they actually said that now they have to look at the skills that young people need coming into the profession. Because in the old days in accounting, you spent the first three or four or five years just crunching numbers. Now the computers are going to be doing more and more of that work, and you're going to be exposed to clients and more contact with people in other disciplines and starting to have to apply professional judgment and you're going to need new skills. And we're talking, we'll talk about those kind of in a little bit. But that's what's going on right now. Now, if you think about technology at that pace, can you beat these machines? No, right? It's futile to try to, to race with these guys. So we'll talk about a few more. This is a study from the AICPA from last year. And this is from CPAs that they surveyed, and 92% of them said that were not, they were not future ready. Future ready being the ability to understand future trends, predict and adapt to those kinds of things, social, technology, demographics, et cetera. And so we've been doing a whole lot of work in Maryland and nationally to help educate our profession so that they're much more what we call future ready, right? They're able to look at this kind of thing and figure that out. These are new skills that even old CPAs, like me, have to have. So now let's talk about some of this idea of oceans of opportunity. And this gets to this idea of where the careers are going. And obviously, a lot of the stats relate to accounting. But I think you can see the general environment for business and all the majors that you're in, finance, IT, et cetera, is going to be extremely strong. So 91% of CPA firms expect to continue record hiring levels. 11% is the projected accounting job growth between 2014 and 2024. Now, what you're also seeing is that's true for business management, but the entry-level positions are actually declining in many of these industries, right? The bookkeeper stuff, the right, clerical stuff in business is actually going down because of automation. So you're going to see more and more of that as we go on. This is the uh, demand for accounting. 38% of employers this is overall demand, not just accounting, report that they have a talent shortage. 
accounting and finance staff is number one in demand and the eighth hardest to fill from a skill perspective. And that's from the Department of Labor and some other uh, manpower uh, forecasts. So some really good news there. Accounting as a career is two of the top 10 best jobs are involved in accounting and finance, by the way. The rest happen to be IT or medical. They've moved in in the last two years in a pretty big way. But accounting's stayed in the top five for quite a while. Accounting is one of the top 20 happiest professions. Happy defined as high pay, lower stress than others. So uh, any of you guys in that notion, um, that's pretty cool. And it's the top 10 in demand and one of the hardest to fill. That's from manpower. So we're seeing these kind of environment is really ripe from a career perspective. So you're, you're uh, looking at some really good uh, career opportunities as you go forward. In the small business sector, we've kind of set new records too. If you're going to actually be an accounting firm, it was the number one most profitable industry. This is the first year we ever beat chiropractors. Because <laughs> that's the number one small business from a profitability perspective. In terms of growth, the accounting profession, if you're in accounting, you know, doing accounting tax and advisory in a small firm environment, they're looking at growth rates between, uh, averaging 12% uh, in 2016. So again, even as a um, small practice, whether you're in a firm or company, et cetera. The other environment that's shifting because of this technology trend, right, these big waves of change, is this idea of what we're managing. So accounting often focuses on what we call hard assets a lot, right? The things that you can actually count and maintain, whether it's uh, receivables or inventory or buildings. And now we're starting to see the value in the top, uh, this is S&P statistics, right, has shifted completely in the last four or five years from, actually a little longer than that, 75 was 83% hard assets, tangible assets, and only 17% intangibles, to now we're looking at 20% tangible assets and 80% intangibles. What that means is that people is one of the number one assets. That's obviously good for all of you entering a profession like this. Um, but it also means you're going to have to learn how to manage different things. Because in the old, old days of the right, industrial age, we managed machines, property, plant, equipment. Now it's about people and all the intangibles, right? Intellectual property, ideas, things like that. So that's a whole new way that this accounting profession is going to have to learn how to manage. You guys in finance will be the same way, and the IT folks will be helping to create all the systems that disrupt all that. So uh, kind of neat stuff going on. Now, the other thing is the fastest growing segment of the accounting profession is actually advisory services. So in the CPA firm area, which is about half the profession, they're starting to see the big growth in there, and there's a lot more non-CPAs going into those consultings, right? IT, finance, CFPs, et cetera. Tax is the second largest growth area expected, and audit third. That's because audit was historically high because of Sarbanes-Oxley uh, and some of the other big things that went in from that point. Now, the other thing that's changing a lot in accounting, I would say, and business, is that our viewpoint has to shift. We have to go from what we would call a historical viewpoint to a more future-focused viewpoint. In other words, you can't drive very fast by looking in the rearview mirror. And what's happening is as things speed up, the cycle of change is going much, much, much faster. We have to be anticipating and looking out to the future a lot more. This is Oracle's CEO who was their CFO. That's the other interesting trend we'll talk about, right? There's a lot more. CFOs moving up into CEO ranks than we've ever, ever seen. I would actually be one of those. But her quote here, I think, captures it pretty well. She said, the way it was in finance, in the world I grew up in, is we spent all our time looking backwards, looking at the numbers, getting them right to the you know, historical, here's how we got here. And she said, modern finance and accounting is now about looking to the future. We have to be much more predictive and future focused. And so that's something that you're going to all be faced with as you start to look at these kind of new careers. And again, it requires different sets of skills. This is what we talked about relative to the CFOs. So if you're in accounting or finance, you move up to the CFO track, 
we're seeing more and more of them becoming pretty high profile CEOs. Did you know that the CEO, retired chairman of Harley Davidson was a CFO and CPA in fact. Um, Phil Knight at Nike I believe was a CPA. Uh, Marriott's new CEO, actually Arne Sorensen, is former CFO. Safra Katz at Oracle, running I think a six billion dollar company, formerly their CFO and now CEO. And if you would have talked about that 10 years ago, everyone would have looked at you like you were crazy. Like there's no way a CFO would ever become a CEO in any of these major corporations. And now it's happening quite frequently. The other one is in COO spots. We're also seeing more CFOs. Now why do you think that's the case? Pardon? I might yell out. You gotta have a handle on numbers, right? You gotta know what the numbers mean and where they come from because business models are being disrupted and so suddenly you're gonna have to see new numbers and figure out new ways of measuring new things like intangibles. So you guys are gonna come into an environment where you're gonna need your best thinking to be able to start looking at constantly like, is this the right number? Is there a different way to measure this? They're measuring all kinds of new things like employee engagement, sustainability ratios, all those kind of things are things that are starting to show up that someone's gotta know how to measure them Someone's got to know how to make sure that those measurements are reliable and begin to think. Integrated reporting is another big trend we're seeing in the accounting profession coming from overseas and it's talking about how do you measure sustainability uh, of a company, right? How is it doing from a brand and ecological perspective? What's it doing with its impact on the environment? How do you measure and report on those things? That's what the environment you're going to see, which we have not gotten to completely from this standpoint. So here's what I tell my CPA audience, right? There are six things we think you have to do relative to surfing lessons. Number one, embrace digital. You're not going to beat the machines. Number two is anticipate. You've got to be future focused and proactive. You can't be constantly reacting. And that's going to be tough in an environment that you're constantly being busier and busier and busier. The number one challenge we face in accounting is everyone would say, like the top three reasons, too, bu too busy, doing more with less, not enough time, and I'm constantly being reactive trying to put out fires. You're going to have to fight that environment early on in your career and learn how to master that from that standpoint. Collaborate. You guys talk a lot about networking here. Collaboration is the number one skill we believe for the future. We would actually say the collaboration curve is replacing the experience curve because there's no way your experience is going to be fast enough to capture everything in any discipline at the rate of change that we're feeling. Instead of what you know, it's going to become who you know. And so what you guys are doing here from a beta alpha psi perspective is so on point. So make sure you think about that. We believe learning is your next competitive advantage. You're going to have to learn, and we say you have to learn faster than the rate of change. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Protect the core. It's going to be important to know what you stand for. We would say your strengths and values. It's also important to know what your companies and employers stand for. What's their purpose and values and do you fit that? And so when everything's changing, it's really important to know what shouldn't change. And what shouldn't change more and more is the core values and core purpose of the organizations you work with. And so for the accounting profession, they actually do have a core purpose and core values that you can uh, look up. And then number six is make time for the future. So the future isn't going to wait for you. So what we've told our CPAs right now in, in practice and in industry, et cetera, is you're going to have to make time. So we say at least start with one hour a week thinking about the future, scanning, looking at articles, publications, short courses, Look at what's coming and not spend time answering emails and catching up on things that are historical, right? Get looking at that future. So that kind of stops that piece. Now I want to give you some good career advice as you kind of get ready for the rest of your couple days here. So if you automate, you must elevate. That was a futurist named Mike Walsh I heard speak not too long ago, and I think he's right on point. So just think about that. As technology automates more and more of what we do, you're going to have to have new skills, elevated skills, or else you're just going to get displaced by machines. And there's all kinds of books and articles right now about how these machines are going to displace a lot of workers around the world from that standpoint. 
And so for you all, this is a great opportunity because you've actually got skills that you can deploy beyond just the routine that a machine might automate. And so we've done some heavy survey work, both nationally and locally, talked to all of our major firms, surveyed them, and said, what are the skills that young people coming out of college today, in accounting for the most part, are missing when they get on the job? And these are the skills. So right now, every one of the folks that you're going to work with is going to want those skills. And the question is, if you're not getting them in school or through Beta Alpha Psi or whatever, you've got to say, how am I going to get these skills? Because these are the ones that actually make a difference. Communication is number one. Writing skills, learning how to write, memos, critically thinking, make, make your points right in a, in a nice, concise way. Critical and strategic thinking, you're going to have to be able to put things in context when you start to explain or uh, talk about something. Advanced Excel, kind of absolutely critical. Time management and organization, you're going to have to time manage yourself. Don't rely on your boss to do that for you. You're going to have to learn how to prioritize or to ask, what, you gave me three things, I don't have all the time today to do that. What, what's most important, right? Learning those kind of things. Prioritization, which is kind of a subset of that. And then number seven, collaboration. You're going to have to be able to get along well with other people, right? That's what they're going to want. And that means to be able to take one and one and make three, right? Your idea and my idea, and we have a better idea together instead of I'm just kind of push my idea on you. Does that make sense? So that's what we're seeing across the board. And everything we look at says those skills are critical in every one of these disciplines. Now, that's our Student Leadership Academy. And I'm going to put Keith on the spot right there because he's one of our, our graduates standing right there. Stand for a minute, Keith. And, let everybody see it. So give, everybody give him a round of applause. So about a year and a half ago, when we were seeing this research, we said to our employers, they're all saying, all the firms, companies are saying, we need people to have these skills. So we said, well, what if we put on a program to start to begin to give students these skills? Now, it's two and a half days, roughly. Um, it's in June, correct? I'm looking at Rebecca. If anybody wants information, come see her. It's not limited to just Maryland schools, but should be kind of in this region for the most part. Anyhow, that was our first group of grads, and we spent, Keith, did we talk about debits and credits at all during those two and a half days? Not at all, right? We focused on every one of those skills other than advanced Excel. We didn't do that in there, but communication, strategic thinking, you know, leadership skills are going to be the things that are going to differentiate you in your career. So I remember when I was in accounting, right, you said, well, why do I got to take this English course and all these other things like that? Those are actually money makers right now. So pay attention in those courses and, uh, and do your best because those will actually help uh, more and more after you graduate. All right, so I want to show this an old picture, but uh, how did I get from the son of a Baltimore City cop to the second most influential guy in the CPA profession? I also like to say, sometimes even a blind squirrel can find a nut. Um, anyhow, I actually wanted to be in accounting because I wanted to be an FBI agent. I wanted to follow my father's kind of law enforcement track, but I wanted to get into college. They didn't have the money to send me to college, so I had to figure out either a scholarship or a pay for it myself. I was fortunate that I had uh, played pretty good football in high school, and Hopkins recruited me. Most people don't know that Hopkins even has a football team, but uh, they did recruit me. Uh, it turned out, though, they didn't have accounting as a major. They would, I would have had to major in political science and take accounting at night school when I had to also work. So I quickly switched over to Loyola's night program and ultimately graduated with a degree in accounting. Now, the problem is doing my uh, undergrad work, I found out that in order to be an FBI agent, you actually had to have uncorrected 2020 vision, which I did not have. I had bad eyesight. So I'm like, now what the heck am I going to do? I want to be an FBI agent. Now I'm in an accounting degree. So I guess I'm going to have to be an accountant, figure this thing out, right? So I started working as a junior accountant. Um, and back in those days, right, this is back in like the 1980 time frame. So CPA firms, accounting firms, didn't hire you from, uh, if you had experience because they wanted you right out of college so they could shape you in their own mold. So when I tried interviewing in this market, none of the firms would have me, so I stayed in an industry track. I was in a finance company. Ultimately went to an architecture firm, ended up in construction, uh, and had a ball. So I spent my whole career in what we call the business and industry segment, uh, became a CFO of a highway construction company. But more importantly, early on in my career, 
uh, a controller actually at the architecture firm who came out of Anderson said the minute you graduate I want you to get your CPA exam and he supported me on that and then as soon as I passed that exam he said you need to join the Maryland Association of CPAs and the American Institute of CPAs and not just join but I want you to get active and uh, that's what I did so I became like a, inside there at that point it was called you'll love this the Electronic Data and Word Processing Committee was the committee we had back then. There was no such thing as computers. They were all mainframes back then, right? They started to have word processors that actually had 64K of memory. You, you young people have no clue what I'm talking about. Um, so the point is, I went and so I just, started, just started getting my job, started working. But volunteering at the association opened my eyes to all kinds of other things that were available and all kinds of people that would ultimately help shape my career as I went forward. Not unlike what you're doing here at Beta Alpha Psi. So the idea of getting involved and doing something beyond just your job is going to be critical for the rest of your career if you want to be successful from that standpoint. And it made all the difference for me. Ultimately, I ended up, our company had gotten disrupted. I had been on the board of directors of the association, been the past chair, and the executive director retired. They went for a national search. And here I am as the CEO of the Maryland Association of CPAs. I never, ever would have said, that's the career I want to be. I wanted to be an FBI agent. So to say that I'm going to be a nonprofit CEO of an association the accounting profession was not even thinkable from that standpoint. And so I want you to be thinking from there as you look forward into your careers, don't think you have to have it all figured out. Because you don't, right? When one door closes, another door, door opens. So be open to looking at opportunities. Just get out there and start working and start making an impact, and then you'll start to see those doors will open for you. Again, back to that keeping your net worth. I want to talk about two other people who have similar winding paths. Rebecca Brown, who's over there right there. And on the right is Kimberly Ellison Taylor. Now, Kimberly is a point of pride for us because she's from Maryland. She actually started out in our Young Professionals Network from a blind email that said, we want some young people to help us reimagine our association. And there was all, it was an under 35 task forces at that point, we called it, which was, by the way, like heresy back then. But our board supported it. Anyhow, Kimberly addressed it. She like rocked it in this under 35 task force. We did reinvent our association. We have a young professionals group that's been phenomenal from this day forward. But because of that, she became quickly a leader in our thing. She got on our board of directors at a very young age. She was one of the youngest chairs of our association. I think she was, what, 30 then? I'm looking at Jackie like 30 years old, the chair of a state CPA society, right, volunteer. She had an interesting career path because she started out, I think, in KPMG, ended up as uh, Prince George's County uh, Chief Technology Officer, went on to Oracle, where she's now the head of their global healthcare practice. But here's the really cool thing. So she was past chair of the Maryland Association of CPAs. She's now going to be, this year in October, the chair of the American Institute of CPAs. She will be the first black chair ever in the history of our profession, 127 years. And she's a she on top of it. And she'll be the youngest chair of the AICPA ever. What do you think? How about a round of applause for Kimberly? <laughs> the reason I tell you that, the reason I tell you that is that could be any one of you in the next few years, right? If you get out there and, and hustle. And she would say a lot of that came from her extra efforts volunteering at the association. She volunteers for just about everything. So I've never seen a lady with that kind of uh, incredible schedule. But um, she's an inspiration. And then Rebecca Brown started out in practice, right? She actually went to the Ohio State. We won't hold that against her. But um, she passed the exam, came back to Maryland, worked in a CPA firm locally. And she was doing the type of work that was just killing her. And she tells the story this way. She did a training with all the staff in their audit. She was doing employee benefit plan audits. And she realized that when they did this survey, she was the only one that had this completely different profile than everyone else. And suddenly, like, the light bulb went off, and she's like, I'm working, like, com I'm swimming completely upstream here. Like, I'll never be able to get this because I'm completely different profile. And so she had done some work with strengths, which I think is critical for you to think about. What are your strengths? And she started looking at herself. She went, this isn't the kind of, I'm a relationship person. I like to be uh, inspired and inspire. I like to do things that are different that would not necessarily be numbers. 
And so we ended up with a job opening, and she came to us. And, uh, and I think now is working in her strength zone. So what I would say is when you get into your careers, you might think this is the path you have to take. Your advisors have said this is the path you have to take or your family or friends, whatever. And it may be a good start, but don't think it's the only way. So in other words, if it doesn't work right away, start to figure out what it is that's not working. Because what it 90% of the time is is that you're not working in your natural strength zone. And we do a lot of work with that with our Leadership Academy. We do a lot of work with our Student Leadership Academy to help them find their strengths and apply their strengths and start to learn that if my strengths don't fit my job, it doesn't mean I'm bad. It doesn't mean I can't do it. It means it's the wrong fit. And so then you start to say, could I find a different fit that gets to where I feel like I'm in the zone and it's not drudgery? And that's a critical thing. Now, will every job be completely in your zone and you'll be you know, in nirvana all the time? No. Every job has tough stuff that you have to do. And you have to get over that. But if it's more than half, you have to start to say, what's going on? And so that's where, again, back to your network and some of those other things would actually help. So two very winding road folks that have done this kind of differently from a career perspective. So I want to st talk about kind of my career advice for you all as you get out there. And you've, you've heard it sprinkled through some of this update, right? But number one is there is no plan. Like there's no master plan and you can think about it and say I'm going to plan my career out for the next 20 years and for a couple of you that might be true but most of you it's not going to be anything like you think it was. Kimberly would have never said she'd be working for Oracle in the global healthcare lead. Rebecca would never say at her young age that she would have been looking, working in an association instead of in a CPA firm, right? So and I would have never ever thought I'd be in a nonprofit. I call it a for-purpose organization uh, doing this kind of work. So you don't know until you actually let things start to happen. So get out there and start to work and don't get overly obsessed with I have to have it all figured out before I even graduate. Make sense? Number two, hustle. It is about hustle, right? You're going to have to work hard. All the majors you're in require hard work. And I got news for you. Every one of the businesses you're going to land in are feeling competition and disruption, those big waves of change, like no tomorrow. And are those big waves going to slow down? No, they're actually speeding up. They're getting bigger and they're coming more frequently. So your best thing is to say, what can I do to help my organizations and really hustle and make an impact and help them figure this stuff out? That's what they need. And so you guys have a completely new set of skills and knowledge than we did back in the day, and we need that desperately in every one of these professions. The next one is about learning. So I like to say in a period of rapid change and increasing complexity, the winners will be those who can keep their rate of learning greater than the rate of change. We actually add N greater than the rate of competition, L greater than C squared. Just write that down, L greater than C squared. Because the half-life of your degrees, do you know what that is? How many years do you think your degree lasts before it becomes obsolete in today's environment? We, one. one. Actually, it's a little longer than that right now, thank God. <laughs> Probably in another year or two, it will be one. It's about three years from what we've seen. Now, when I did this in 1982 is when I graduated from Loyola, my accounting degree was probably had a half-life of about 15 years, right? I basically shoved all that knowledge in my head, and then I sold the inventory for the next 15 years of that knowledge because there weren't major changes that happened, right? Standards didn't change overnight. They changed every five or 10 years, and then it was usually just tweaks. Taxes, the big thing was the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Up until that, taxes hadn't changed much. So none of those things changed over time. And when you get into the work world, the folks you're working with won't understand that because it hasn't happened to them, right? They've been in this environment. They haven't realized how much things have changed. But your, your knowledge is actually depreciating at a much faster rate than my knowledge and the older members of the professions or businesses that you're going to be joining. And they might not even understand that. So you need to understand it because you're going to have to keep yourself sharp. So what does that mean? That means you can't just rely on your employer to take care of your professional learning. 
Many employers will, right? They'll support you with continuing education if you're CPAs, and they'll send you to training, but they're gonna train you on what you're doing for them. They might not train you on the skills that you're gonna need to survive rapid automation. So you're gonna have to make sure you figure out how to get access to that, whether it's learning online, there's MOOCs, right? There's all kinds of tidbits, just reading, finding like LinkedIn influencers to follow. There's all kinds of ways of keeping up with what's going on, but keep your learning sharp. Spend that one hour in the future, learning, scanning, understanding the trends, and thinking about what they mean to your career and to your job. That's gonna be absolutely critical from that perspective. So you're gonna to have to say, what am I doing to keep my rate of learning greater than the rate of change? And I can't just rely on my employer from that standpoint. Okay, number four, your network is your net worth. We talked about the collaboration curve. We've talked about the value of networking. You guys talked about that up here. That's absolutely critical. And you guys are an advantage because social media is an incredible way to kickstart those networks, right? So here's what I would say to that. Like my older folks in our profession still are scared to death of social media. They think it's like a rattlesnake, right? They like to look at it, but they don't want to touch it. So what we've been trying to say is that social media combined with real life contact is the absolute critical set of weapons you need, right, to do that. So the point is, just that little micro tweet or LinkedIn, et cetera, gives you a familiarity. And when you meet that person in, when you meet that person, in person, Suddenly you're like, yeah, I remember. I remember, Michael. I remember we connected, right? And it, I feel more familiar because of that micro exchange because of that. So every time you meet someone, you get a business card, go in LinkedIn, LinkedIn right away with them, right? If they're on Twitter, connect to them on Twitter. Do whatever you can to connect to as many people as you can, and it will make a huge impact on you. Now, LinkedIn made me an influencer because of social media. We got into social media earlier. By the way, my Twitter handle is at Tom Hood, if any of you guys want to follow me. You can get me on LinkedIn. I'll be more than happy to LinkedIn with you. And uh, I think yesterday I hit 168,000 followers on LinkedIn. Now, I didn't market to any of them. I didn't sell to any of them. It's just because they like what I was putting out there. So start to think about those networks as really, really critical from that perspective. And keep yourself sharp from the whole idea of networking. See, look, he's looking me up right now. I knew it. So the other one is friend. IBM Watson. So we talked about IBM Watson, and I'll never forget this. I was in Western Maryland, young professional sitting in the front. She just graduated from Frostburg, and I'm talking about all the standards changes that are going on. And at that point, this is about two years ago, there had been the new private company financial standards that came out of uh, FASB. There had been another one from the AICPA called FIRFSME. You're probably learning about that, right? Financial Reporting Framework for Small to Medium Enterprises. And so she's like sitting there and her eyes are like, this is just big. And she's like, those two sets of standards happened since I graduated in May? This is like in the fall? And I said, yeah, they have. See what I mean by half-life? That's exact example of that. But she's like, and, and are they gonna be on the CPA exam? I said, yeah, probably. So just think about it, she had just graduated there were two new sets of accounting standards promulgated and passed in that six month period. Now, any of us here who've been around a while, did that never happen in our environment, <laughs> am I right? It, it, it took, again, it was 15 or 20 years. So my point, so she's sitting there, right, and I'm telling the story about automation, all that, and she goes, I got it. I'm gonna go out and friend IBM Watson right now. And you know what? You can. IBM Watson has a face page, Facebook page. It also has a Twitter account. So go to look up IBM Watson on Facebook and friend it and you'll keep up with what IBM Watson is doing, by the way, which is worth doing. Go to Twitter, it's at IBM Watson. Say Tom Hood sent you when you sent out that first tweet. And IBM Watson will give you updates of what it's doing. It's doing all kinds of incredible things, and it's just getting started. So auditing is just one of them. It's doing healthcare, it's doing financing, it's doing cooking. Uh, it's, it's all kinds of incredible things that are going on, and it's just getting faster and faster. And then Google has its AlphaGo. Anybody saw the AlphaGo? So Alpha, their new uh, supercomputer project, beat Go, the ancient Chinese game, 
right? Beat a human in Go. And I think it won four out of five matches, which they thought was like impossible for a machine to do, right? Because a machine could do chess because mathematics. But this game has no mathematics in it. And it figured it out. That's the difference, right? These computers don't care about math anymore. These are cognitive computers. They can understand English and context and learn and do things that we never imagined. So you guys and ladies are going to have to make IBM Watson your friend. Because Can you beat IBM Watson? No. You'll never beat IBM Watson. So instead, you need to say, how do I harness the power of technology to do my job even better so I can spend more time on the things that computers can't do. Computers, what they can't do, they can't create trust. Computers don't have empathy. They can't build relationships. They can't collaborate yet. So those are all things, the skills that we talked about are skills that computers can't do well yet. So your job is to say, how do I keep getting the skills and applying the skills that computers can't do? Because everything that can be automated will be automated, guaranteed, and at faster and faster paces. And the following is uh, the kind of closing point there is make a difference. So whatever you do in every job you start to do, go in there with everything you've got, hustle, and do the best you can. That will certainly give you more relationships, more networks, and it'll give you the ability to open up more doors. And even if that's not the perfect job, that's not the perfect fit, something else will start to open up for you. And then you'll start that path that looks, as Rebecca says, like Lombard Street in San Francisco. It's a very crooked kind of constant movement back and forth. So I love to close with this one from Steve Jobs, because he said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. And he tells a story about when he was in college taking calligraphy and design. And he was in the moment going, why do I, why do I need these things, right? What, what's it, what does this have to do? And when he did the first Mac computer, those things came in, right? The design and all the things that they did that really started to separate them. So he says you can only connect them by looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, Destiny, life, karma, whatever, it has made all the difference in my life. And we would say it will make all the difference in your life. So just trust that you'll be able to look at everything you do and then look backwards and go, oh, I remember by me volunteering at the MACPA, how that got me to here, right? And then that got me to there. And you'll start to see how all those dots start to ultimately connect for a wonderful, exciting, successful career in your future. And so I want to close with this one. Our purpose at MACPA, so we're the Maryland Association of CPAs, but our purpose that we just adopted not too long ago with our, our board of directors, our staff, kind of a completely collaborative environment was, our purpose is to lead the transformation of the world through the accounting profession, Maryland first, and make a positive difference. So we literally do think that sometimes a small group of people committed to a neat cause. That's how Beta Alpha Psi started. That's how we started as the MACPA in 1900. A small group of people had an idea that said, we need a profession in the United States. And Maryland was one of the first three states to enact the CPA law 116 years ago. And so who's not to say that we can't make an impact in the world by saying these success skills that we're starting to train people on are making an impact. And like putting that little pebble in the pond, those ripples, go all kinds of places that you might not ever, ever understand fully, but they make a huge impact. So I want you over the next two days to be thinking about and applying some of this stuff to your experience here at Beta Alpha Psi and starting to say, how can we make a difference? Because you guys can make an incredible difference, more now than ever, because of technology, as a matter of fact. So with that, I want you to have a tremendous couple of days here. I loved being with you. And thank you very much.